Oh, look. Uh, oh my god, I lost all of my thoughts. Anyways, hi, hello, how are you? Uh, my name is Opal, if you didn't know. Um, and I, uh, well, I do content things. And you're probably thinking, yeah, no shit, this is a YouTube video that I'm watching right now. I would assume that you do content things. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, specifically, uh, the content thing in question is a while back, I had a Kofi goal set up. Uh, not the one that's there now, but a different one. Um, where I, not thinking too much about it, uh, said that if I got a certain amount of nations, I would make a podfic of a very particular uh, Riftdale fic. Uh, I will not go into details about what one, I've talked about it before. Uh, but I didn't realize that that fic was... oh god. I want to say either 21,000 words long of 16 chapters or 16 or 16,000 words that are across 21 chapters. I don't remember which one it was, but it was one of those. It was the kind of thing that would have taken like well over two hours, like well over an hour to listen to. Um, and I didn't, and I was like, okay, it's fine, I've committed. Um, and then I got to a particular chapter in said fic, um, but even before I could read it out loud, um, reading the words with my eyeballs um, made my eyes um, threaten to file for divorce from my brain. Um, nothing against the fic itself. It's a lovely fic. I remember enjoying it back in uh, when I first read it in like 2018. Uh, but it's just not the thing for me anymore. Um, and there are some other logistical issues with it too. But uh, suffice to say, I would not be able to keep that promise. Um, but I wanted to do something similar in scale to what I had initially anticipated that project being when I made the Kofi goal originally, because at the time I was only thinking of the prequel, um, which was much shorter. And actually, I thought the prequel was longer than it is. Um, I just thought the whole thing would be a lot more like smaller and more manageable, and I misremembered some of the details. Whatever. I wanted to do something um, to kind of match the, what I had originally planned as the scale for that particular piece. Um, which is this. And uh, what this is, is I was inspired um, by rewatching an old stream, and I was like, hey, you know what else I like to do? Because I like the act of actually reading things out loud. I think it's very fun. Um, but I know what won't make my want to crawl out of my own bones, and that is fix that I have written within the last three years. Um, and as of recording this, it has been, um, it is May 20th, so it has been about a week. Um, it will be a week in however many hours it is until six o'clock. I don't care to do the math. Um, it'll have been a week since the end of Act 4 of Pull for Initiative Bedlam. Um, and if you have watched the ending of Act 4 to Pull for Initiative Bedlam, you will understand why that's a big occasion. And if you haven't, you should. It's a good series, and I love it a lot, and it made me cry um, really good tears. Uh, the tears were sad, but the good kind of sad, where it's a deeply impactful piece of media um, that you love with your with a lot of your heart. So, uh... <laughs> Which basically is by way of saying that I have three completed and one partially completed pull for initiative fic of varying levels of heartbreaking that I am now going to read to you with my voice. I don't know how long this is going to be going in, I've decided to not do the math, um, but I will introduce each piece individually as we go, uh, so there's a clear delineation uh, between the pieces. I'm pretty sure all of these pieces contain spoilers um, for Acts 2 and beyond. Um, I will kind of give a heads up with spoiler warnings and content warnings um, as I introduce each one. Uh, just And this is a YouTube video, or will it be eventually? It's not now, but it will be. And I'll have 
all of that in the description as well, as well as a link to Pull for Initiative itself, because like I said, if you've never watched uh, Pull for Initiative, it's good. Uh, 10 out of 10. One of my favorite things of all time. Um, stop listening to this and go watch Pull for Initiative instead. Um, <laughs> before <laughs> there's so much content you can't catch up. That's a joke. There can never be too much Pull for Initiative. Um, yeah. I'm... We're just gonna get to it. We're just gonna get to it. Uh, I'm gonna get a roughly in chronological order for the fix. For the free completed fix. The final one. We'll talk about it when we get there. Um, but. Without further ado. Going up. Lee's DeForest upbringing was cursed from the start. Uh, heads up. This fix. Uh. Well, for general audiences, does contain um, some mild references to child abuse, uh, which is a prequel with slightly spoilers for Acts 3 and 4. Growing up in Tielifrun was always going to be weird. With a father who was the country's only consistent human occupant and a mother fading blindless to the implications of their relationship, Lise would have been in enough trouble already. But elves do not grow as humans do. No, elves grow far slower. Elves have centuries to live, to grow, to find their way. When August de Forest holds his daughter for the first time, he learns from the room's chatter that one of the elves who clings to the skirts of the attendants, looking on with big blue eyes and child would wonder, is a few years older than him. Humans, as his wife seemed to forget sometimes, have decades. A single century, if they were lucky. He knows, and his wife denies, that Lise will take far more after him. It was a risk he was willing to take. Lise learns to talk when she is 14 months old. It's a mix of things, some words in Elven and others in Common, depending on where she learned them. Builds of sentences that don't always work together, but that most adults in her life can figure out. Her mother corrects her, always in Elven. Her father teaches her more Common anyway. The elves born in the spring before her look like newborns, still. Lee starts to toddle shortly after she learns to speak, following on anyone who will let her, exploring the mansion where she lives and the garden growing behind it. Not into the woods, of course, not only would his wife have his head, but August doesn't want her to get lost or worse, hurt, but around the flowers and butterflies of Tielavrun's eternal warmth, where she can point and ask questions that don't quite know what they're meant to be yet. She plays with elves who are approaching the end of their first decade of life, after her second birthday, they're all too young to keep playing with her. August starts to tell stories of his family to Lise when she's four years old, almost ready to start her education and old enough to understand his tales enough to be dazzled by them. She loves every second as much as her mother hates them. They're not proper stories, she insists a few times once Lise is asleep, and telling her they're real will only fill her head with dreams where soon there will need to be a proper education. August can hear the emphasis in her voice and knows when she says proper, she means elven. It stings. Lise has no playmates anymore. Too much heartbreak when she has to leave them behind. Surely it's not too hard to entertain a child. Lise is very, very lonely. Her mother insists that children can be taught. And August is not always around to stop her from yanking on Lisa's sensitive ears when she asks too many questions. Her elven tutors don't do very well with Lise at first. All too used to simple lessons that can take years to learn, vocabulary that's not peppered with a sailor's vernacular, children who have friends and siblings who can help teach them to sit down and listen, at least for a little while. Adjusting for the fast pace of a lone half-elf child raised by a man more comfortable on the wave than in the courtroom, leaves a lot of time for Lise to wander off and sharp consequences for both tutor and student when she does so. They don't learn fast enough. They try. They try. They learn from scholars who come in with books and secrets to trade. They ask questions and try ideas from every place imaginable to get at least to sit and learn. Which she does, to some extent. August is happy she's getting an education. His wife, overcorrecting with Lise's clear development timeline, is annoyed it's not more efficient. Lise understands, in the way a child does, that she's doing something wrong when her mother's frown, hand, twitches and her parents don't look at each other very much. 
but the child's habits are the hardest to break. She runs off to the edge of the woods sometimes. It's nicer there than at home. She knows she'll get in trouble for it, but six-year-olds are not known for their decision-making skills, human or half-elf. Lise still asks for feeding stories when she goes to bed. They're her favorites, comforting and exciting all at once, and her father always looks so happy that she wants to hear them all over again. Most nights he tells her other stories instead, ones his mother read to him when he was little, but she asks anyway. Lise gets very good at pretending to be asleep, because if they think she's asleep, it's much easier for her to sneak into the garden at night. She's still not prepared when she hears what none of them could have known was the final argument in that house. Lise grows up among ladies in waiting, all older than her father. They do not like her, and she does not like them. On a day that started so much like the rest, Lise collapses in her yard, overcome with sobs only a child can muster. Because her birthday has come and gone, her mother has stopped answering questions about where her father is, and more and more things have just become too much. She meets a friend as the world falls still, looking as lost as she feels in her tears, and when she reaches out to him for the first time, the way the little fox bumps his head against her hand is softer than any royal dress her mother could offer her. They run off to play in the woods, and she remembers what it's like to have fun. She names him Foxblood. Lise spends most of her teen years dodging lessons, duties, and her mother alike. She grows up in the whispering wood, making other friends who don't give her side-eye glances every time she walks into the room, or seem to cross their legs away from her when she sits. It's never words, never enough to sting, but they hurt all the same. And in the woods, they're all happy to see her. In the woods, there are no suitors asking for a hand she has no desire to give. No sickly, sweet, fake smiles that make her throw up on elven finery. No princesses that want to play the rough and tumble games least missed out on, up until the consequences of those games become apparent. In the woods, Lise can teach Foxblood how to play fetch, and learn how to make about the ways makeup can be fun instead of boring, ignore the whispers of tensions outside the aisles that matter little even to the nobles discussing them, let alone a teenager with no ear for political moves. When Lise is 20 years old, she comes face to face with a child, and it is only through a dim memory that she realizes the two of them are the same age. She waves and moves on before they can ask her any questions. Lise spends as much of her time in the woods as she can, with more pressure to attend court, to marry, to be proper for once, breathing down her neck than before. She reads there, sometimes. Books from outside the Yellen room, ones that her mother was never fond of her checking out, least now big enough that her mother can't snatch them out of her hands and smack her over the head for it. She wonders if her father had a childhood like they talk about in the books. She wonders if she could have had a childhood if she wasn't of noble blood, that she didn't live in Tielen room. She wonders why her father never came home, because if she wondered about it, she could ignore the sore part of her that wonders if he just didn't want the hassle of caring for her anymore. She wonders, despite herself, why he couldn't have taken her with him. Lise should be almost in her thirties when she sees him again. The worst ending. The ending we got was rough, yes. Time lost, things abandoned, repairs to make. But surely, if the Inquisition had been just a bit more bloodthirsty, it could have gone worse. This is everything going wrong. Big warnings for blood and death and poison. Yeah. The order in which things happened wasn't entirely clear to Lise. She wasn't always good at keeping track of things in fights, focusing her rage on who and what needed to be burnt to a crisp and any space left in her mind on making sure anyone who went down was healed. And especially not in a fight like this. Fights where she saw red, where she couldn't have cared less for the other cultists, where all she wanted was to burn Varric from the inside out and watch him crumble. The fireballs crashing into her from all sides hurt, sure. But the burns egged her on, stoked the fire in her chest, reassured her that what she was needed was to take this man out of the world one way or another. Damn any promises she'd made. He was a threat, 
He was probably lying, and he had set her new life careening off on the wrong foot. She couldn't see she regretted it. Not with Cassandra her back, not knowing her ship was waiting for them, not with the fire enveloping her body, but he'd killed Quinn, and if they could have made it off the islands together. Lisa told him she was think thinking about how to save the entire world, and she meant that. A plan which now demanded that he was taken out of the picture. She would just have to... And one of those things that happened was that she was distinctly aware that something was wrong with Foxbud, that he was distanced, that he was out of... And the church shook, making her almost lose her footing. She stumbled in, and Helga made a noise at least didn't think she was capable of making. Wet and sick and full of pain, and, and Cassandra screamed her name like in the purple worm in that way Lise never wanted to hear again, it, and Varric was in her face, far too close to her face. And there was a knife, buried in Lise's stomach. Varric was grinning. Lise coughed and splattered blood all over his face, which would have been funny in any other circumstance but this one. His words didn't even make it to her ears, drowned out as they were by her own heart being by someone she couldn't. It was Bedlam in the back of her the back of her mind registered, pleading with either her or Varric, but his voice was wavering and she didn't have the space to tell the difference. Lise tried to blast him. She did more intense things while she was dying. This should have been no sweat. The feather was right there. But the flames faltered and didn't. He was doing some to her. He must be... Beric's hand left the dagger to slide its own way out of her stomach, and he grabbed Lise by the hair, drinking her head around. The room swam, and in the precious few seconds she had to think, Lise realized the motherfucker had poisoned her. What had Merlin ever seen in this guy. What had Artemis had Quinn? Merlin had said all that bullshit about the man he used to be, an adventurer, a hero, someone who wanted to help the people of Caliban. Clearly, that man was dead, probably buried in some backwoods grave along with however many lives the Inquisition had taken. If they could see this, Varric, they'd understand. Gone was whoever they'd known back then. He was nothing but a bastard to the core, and he was going to be dead when she shook this off when... Foxbud wasn't... The thought tried a few more times to get through her head, scrambling for the last word, but that would require acknowledging what she was seeing. Foxbud wasn't... He wasn't in the room. He wasn't in the ethereal plane. He'd been standing right there. There should have been a puddle of mist there, a sign that he'd come back soon, a sign that she hadn't lost her best friend, that she'd kept him safe, that they were there for each other, that Foxblood wasn't... See, every variable, Lise. Even the ones you thought I wasn't looking for. Lise's body was starting to go numb. Her legs wanted to buckle, but Varric's grip on her hair kept her upright. It should have hurt supporting so much of her weight by her hair, but the thickening sensation of fluid in her lungs took a much, much higher priority in what attention she could scramble together. Bedlam was definitely talking to Varric now. He was angry. He was demanding something. She felt Varric's replies more than she heard them when he shook Leech in response to something Bedlam was saying. Her eyes wanted to close. She forced them open. Helga was bleeding. Helga was... Helga was breathing, wasn't she? Wasn't she? There was a lot of blood on the floor. Helga was standing. Helga wasn't moving. Helga's eyes were glassed over. Her hammer unceremoniously scattered at her feet. Her chest moves in jerks, hyperventilating instead of breathing. When she coughed, Lee saw something that was too dark to be blood coming out of her mouth. Helga collapsed. She wasn't breathing. Lise couldn't get enough air in her lungs to scream. I see they followed instructions. Varric was talking to her. The knife he left in her stomach clattered to the floor. I'm so glad you were so open with your relationship and made this a much easier decision to make. They had a knife to Cassandra's throat. 
She couldn't tell which of the coldest it was. They all looked the same. They all deserved the same damnation. But even in the midst of dying, she could see the dread in her girlfriend's eyes. Cassandra's scimitars had clattered to the floor, her drum cut open and thrown several feet away. Someone's blood splattered across the front of her shirt. Her footlocks were gone. There was a glint of metal and one was against her spine. Tears were trickling down her face. Neither of them could speak. I need you out of the picture, least de Forest. Varric hissed, closer to her ear now, her body pulled upwards. And this way, none of them can fight in your name, so you won't even grace the history books. A shot rang out, echoing in the high ceilings of the cathedral. But it wasn't the gun to Cassandra's spine, no, a fact which Lise registered because her vision went black and she dropped from Varric's grip, kicked down the steps of the cathedral. She remembered what dying felt like the first time. She remembered the flash of acid burn that pulled her under, the smell of her skin and hair dissolving, the way everything faded away only to snap back into focus as the phoenix fire tore her from death. This wasn't that. This was the world falling out from under her, the sounds of a scream echoing inside the gunshot, a dim awareness that the hole in her body had widened, her breaths coming shorter and shorter, a hacking cough, her muscles tensing as the impact from the stairs made itself known, tight in places where bruises would have formed if she wasn't torn open. This was the sound of Sounds of struggle and someone begging her to not do this again, a blown-out birthday candle. But still, her magic tried. Phoenix fire clawed its way across her body, trying to knit back together what it could, trying to patch her up from the inside out, reminding her what it felt like for fire to hurt. She couldn't remember fire ever hurting. It had always been something that came so naturally to her, something that cradled her and tied her to a legacy so much older than she was, a cycle as old as time. She knew fire hurt other people, but never her. Never when it was trying so hard to bring her back, never when she was so close to... The floor of the cathedral around her was scorched. The pews were more on fire than before. Someone grabbed Lisa's hair and she fought back. She clawed at their hands, tried to burn anything she could reach, thrashed and screamed and... She turned and met Cassandra's eyes as three things happened at once. First, Cassandra's broken heart was spilling from her eyes, her last act to witness Lise die again, this time writhing in pain. Second, there was a glint of metal as the cultist holding the knife to her throat pulled their hand back. Third, there was a second gunshot. Cassandra dropped to the ground. Lise screamed. The pews were all set ablaze, the robe of the coldest holding her, the roof and the windows and everything that could hear her cry. If they were listening, even the heavens felt everything in Lise de Forest shatter. Two more gunshots. The world went dark. Varric watched the ceiling burn for a moment. It would surely cave in if he let it. The Doom Dawn Inquisition took the key that had led the Chaos Crusaders to their doom and left. Please come home to my arms again. Cassandra has a night to herself. Maybe that wasn't such a great idea. Big episode 39 spoilers, but otherwise no warnings. The captain's cabin was so empty. Cassandra understood why Lise was quarantining. She'd had a front row seat to the explosion, to the city going up in flames. She watched a man disintegrate under the force of Lise's flames. But she'd also seen Lise's terrified expression, how her hands had shook from the power coursing through her veins, the way she'd fussed over Helga Fox, but in the shifting tempest while they were escaping. An accident. It must have been something to do with the sky fracturing. Lisa's magic acted up sometimes, which Cassandra felt you remember trying to tell her, words that were almost certainly lost in a thrill at all. But Lisa was still so afraid of hurting someone again. 
It hadn't hit until they'd met up with the Dreadnought that morning to exchange news, crews, and strategies. The previous two days had been a blur of coordinating, running, hunting, hiding, commanding. Cassandra had missed Lise, of course she had, but she'd been sleeping at odd times and in worse places. Seeing August step onto the deck, the bot Cassandra and start looking around with an expression that she could best describe as ocean bottom dread for his daughter, afraid he'd lost her again. Only for Cassandra to have to break the news that Lise wasn't coming. It snapped something that Cassandra had been ignoring. Lise was safe. Yes, alive and breathing, but terrified of herself, of what she'd done, even if it wasn't her fault. And now, Cassandra was alone in their cabin. The Shifting Tempest had recovered his injuries from his time in the care of Crunchwrap Supreme, but most of the things Lise had added, the things that they had added together, were somewhere in the bottom of the sea or thrown away somewhere irretrievable. So the bed wasn't the fluffy, king-sized mattress Lise had stuffed into this corner what felt like was years before, just a standard thing barely big enough for the two of them. But it may as well have been the king-sized bed with how empty the space beside her felt. Hell, maybe the king-sized mattress would have felt less lonely, because at least the king had felt like a home away from home. Where was home anymore? All of the places Cassandra had ever called home were unrecognizable, dripping with orin colors and sneering Templars. Could the Shifting Tempest be a home? Could a person? Was Lise her home? She needed to get out of here. Cassandra tossed the blanket aside. Sitting on the bed was about as far as she managed before crumbling in on herself, elbows on her knees and face in her hands. Her breath came in short, choppy shoulder shudders, her body not sure whether it wanted to cry or not. Gods, when was the last time she cried? It... The worm. It was after the worm. Even then, they'd been together. They... Her breathing got shorter and shorter. This wasn't crying, this was panic. It hadn't occurred to her how used she'd gotten to having Lisa around, not necessarily physically with her all the time, but at least reachable. Even when they slipped to go shopping or run errands or fight, she knew in the bad, deepest parts of her heart that they'd always find their way back to each other. And yeah, Lisa wasn't that far away, but this... It, it was like after Quinn died. The feeling snapped into focus and punched the air out of Cassandra's lungs as she put the word to it. This was grief. A grief that was maybe a long time coming. A grief for before this war. For the simmering heat of whispers of war rather than bathing in its flames. For the fall festivals and costumes and teasing Lisa about being so resistant to learning something for once. For traveling the open ocean without washing their backs. All things snatched from their fingers by the cruelty of a man instigating a war to end the world. Cassandra knew Lise was coming back. She'd promised. They weren't the kind to get separated by something as, as stupid as one magic accident that no one blamed her for. Cassandra's mind hadn't gotten the memo. Maybe just knowing just how close Lise was, so close and completely locked off from her, made this all worse. Her heart was pounding, deafening her with its pleas to run, to find what it was looking for, to fall asleep not in the light of the moon, but basking in the gentle glow of Lise's hair, to wrap itself in her warmth that melted the cold, salty exterior of Cassandra's years at sea. She would sleep on the floor of the Shifting Tempest, if that's what it would take, if that's what would get, if that's what would get them next to each other, even if the air up here so much as was so much colder above the clouds as they were, a chill she hadn't felt until now, until her blood was ice in her veins and tears were dragging themselves on her face. She wasn't sobbing, she was shivering. Violent shivers made her muscles ache and her tail rock with sharp, jerky thrashes. The world was swimming, threatening to fall out from under her, leave her tumbling to the floor and out of the sky, down far 
a wet nose pressed itself into her hands. Tears did not do her any favor of stopping or even slowing. The snout that the nose belonged to pushed her hands apart and out of the way, revealing Foxblood's devastated expression. She tried to speak and nothing came out. Another attempt earned her a sticky sob. Foxblood nuzzled his face into hers, whining and trying his best to lick her tears away. His touches didn't feel... real. This didn't feel real. The room was impossibly big, and Cassandra felt so fucking small. Foxblood tried to nuzzle her to get into her lap to yip and cry soft enough that she would listen to him. Something fizzled in her chest, her panic giving way to something quieter, something hiding underneath, wrapped it up in tangles of grief and bringing tears to her eyes. Foxblood tried again to get her attention, planting his face in her hands. With her vision shaking, chest heaving, body crying, she couldn't help but see Foxblood as she had when they met, just overlap dog-sized, full of wonder at the world and a protectiveness of Lise that melted when he met Cassandra, small enough for Lise to hold up, and, and Cassandra was fully sobbing. Her hands clapped over her ears to block out the sounds of her own crying. The rattle of weeks, months, years of pain crumbling down around her, so loud the gods could hear her collapsing, so quiet the whole world was just her and Foxbud in this cabin, this cabin that shouldn't have felt so empty, this cabin that was all at once a home and a prison and a sign of things to come and things long past. Foxbud was whining, pushing against her, licking her face and pawing at her legs. She screwed her eyes shut, trying to block it out, trying to block out the sounds and the sights and the memories needling at her chest, her scars, her face, blades, gunshots, screaming, and bodies hitting the floor and the smell of acid burning her throat, trying to block out the moonlight that very well could be coils of magic darkness. Every anxiety she'd had since meeting Lee slipped flelm behind while crawling out of her stomach, blocking her throat and sounding off every breath in her chest with that horrible, horrible crunching of dragging a stranded rowboat across a rocky beach. Cassandra had not been seasick in a long time. She remembered it. The rocking so unnatural under her feet and the emptiness of not being able to hold anything down. The fight between the bodies craving for control and the fact that doing so would require vomiting over the side of a moving ship, staring down at the endless ocean below. She'd had it better than some, having been around boats as long as she had, but it was still a condition she was glad to get over. Not least because the darkness below the ship was always more unsettling than the ship itself. She would take that, all of that, every moment she spent her free time clutching masks and, masks and railings to avoid falling over and to pack not once but twice, if it meant she could stop living in this moment and skip to the ending where she got to take Lisa to her arms and never let go. She was never going to let go again. The bed shifted, dipping under another weight. Boxblood nudged Cassandra's hand away from her ear, pawing at her arm and whining quieter now mournful as a fox could sound. She was still crying, eyes still screwed shut. With one arm dislodged, he could curl up at her side, pulling her free hand to rest on his shoulders. Cassandra found herself curled into a ball on the bed, crying, spiraling, spiraling until she was exhausted, Foxwood taking the space where Elise usually lay, ears pinned down and dreams fitful. And Cassandra fell asleep against her bed, despite her best wishes. Her dreams were full of flames, screaming, the sound of her own sobs, the sound of Lisa's, the smell of acid, and she woke up alone. Uh, hello. Um, as you probably noticed, there's still more video to go. However, I haven't recorded it yet, I just know there's gonna be a lot of video to go. I'm just gonna put my outro here, um, because the next piece that I'm gonna read is a work in progress Cassandra fic I've had in the work since about October of 2023, 2022 um, and it's almost 6,000 words long and that as you probably noticed reading a thousand words takes about 10 minutes um, so I'm just gonna get my outro in now anyways um, I hope those of you who were aware of my bit uh, you accept this in return. I may come back and do more podfix later. I will probably come back and do more podfix later. Um, but I, like I said, I just, I tried. I did my best with, with the, 
the what will I do a bit, but I, I have to, at a certain point, you know, my personal comfort and emotional safety comes before content, uh, and I'm sure no one who is actually listening to this will counter me on that. Um, so regardless, I hope you enjoyed listening to these little fix. I hate how much I managed to predict, and I'll leave it at that. Vis-a-vis -vis that, I mean, I think it's a sign of a good story because obviously I could see where the fucking, um, the writing on the wall, um, but that's neither here nor there. Um, whatever. Thank you for, not whatever, but, you know, uh, thank you for listening. Um, I hope you enjoyed them, um, however many you may or may not have listened to. Um, special shout out, thank you, um, Ben and Seth, obviously for making Pull for Initiative Bedlam, um, and also Lux because she's been the one who's known about the bit the longest and has had to hear me bitch about it the most. Um, and also, not just the bit, but also um, all of these fics. Um, so, uh, please enjoy, should you uh, decide to go on to listen to this, um, the preview of this fic, which is about Cassandra and the backstory I invented for her in my head and also her experience in the campaign itself. Um, watch Pull for Initiative. If you've gotten this far and haven't watched Pull for Initiative, um, Wild, go watch Pull for Initiative. Um, I'll be back with more things later. Um, and if I put this out what I think I will, uh, I said the day that, if I put this out what I think I will, um, hopefully, don't yell at me. I'll say that. Uh, <laughs> uh, but yeah, enjoy. I'd love to hear what you think. I'd love to hear if there's anything, maybe a fic of yours, a fic of mine, a fic where I could realistically ask the person, whatever, something, if you'd like to hear me read it, I'd love to give it a look over and see if that might be something I'd be interested in doing a reading for. Um, not like a, not like a, not like a tarot reading, like a, yeah, like the thing I just did for like 30 minutes yeah that you know i don't know why i'm repeating my whatever anyways thank you bye have a lovely day um yeah oh, welcome to the the final part of this um my little my little read through a pull for initiative that little fix of mine um a couple of quick sets up uh, first of all this one has uh, spoilers for acts one and two um as well as some speculation on, on cassandra's backstory um, it's also unfinished. Uh, most of the first half is finished, but most of the second half is not. I'm not really going to be indicating when stuff is or isn't unfinished, but if something seems to end abruptly or is phrased weirdly, that is probably why. Um, but yeah, and also there's some stuff in here. Pretty much all of it's canon, but there's a couple of details that I just kind of filled in the blanks for. Um, so, you know. Your name is Cassandra Veer. It also contains some mild, violency, spooky content, but very mild. Your parents name you Cassandra Veer. Your name is Cassandra Veer, and you have just seen your parents' corpses. You were not supposed to. In fact, the man who saved you instructed you specifically to look away from the carnage in the living room. But a child's curiosity is hard enough to subdue when they were not just locked in a closet where, while their home was attacked. You didn't see much, not with all the other bodies in the room and the man gently ushering you out the door, cursing to himself in a language you do not understand, but you think you recognize your mother's skin, red like your own, shining with a glint that reminds you of the ocean, even amongst the bodies, even with her eyes rolled back in her head. The man shuts the door to your home behind you and picks you up, unsure but steady. He reminds you of the sailors that go in and out of your town, up and down the docks, that visit your home with packages wrapped in brown paper. You feel your eyes get heavy, and you lean against the man as he takes you somewhere, somewhere away from here, and you don't quite process what he's saying as you fall asleep, but he sounds sad. You dream of screams echoing down a hallway you can't see the end of. Your name is Cassandra Veer, and you have a new home now. The man who rescued you told you in the soft words on the boat to your new home that his name is Quinn, and that you'll have a new mom to watch over you there. You don't understand all of the words he says to the other sailors, but he made sure you didn't get too—you didn't get scared when the boat rocked and you saw the open ocean for the first time. When you dock again, he calls for someone before you even get off the boat, and before you know it, you're being passed to a big, warm hug, a woman whose voice rumbles in her chest as she asks Quinn what happened, who you are. 
Her name is Jay, you gather from what he tells her. In her arms, you are farther above the ground than you have ever been before. You turn around as they talk, Quinn speaking in those low words you don't understand, and Jay answering in turn. The buildings remind you of home, and that their wood is stained with sea salt, and they are held together with love and constant repairs. The sound of the ocean threatens to lull you back to sleep. You try to resist, but wake up on a low mattress later, the setting sun sprawling across the floor. Jay is waiting, reading a book beside you, and she ruffles your hair with a big smile when she notices you're awake. She must be your new mom. You don't even have to tell her you're hungry before Jay sweeps you up into her arms and takes you downstairs. Food is already waiting. Jay tells you that she was waiting for you to wake up before she ate. Quinn is there, staring at the table with an expression you don't recognize, but he tries to smile at you when Jay sets you down on a chair. Quinn stays for a few days. When he leaves, he hands you a spyglass and tells you it will keep you safe. Jay promises that you'll see him again. Your name is Cassandra Veer, and you are learning to live your new life. Jay runs a lot of No Man's Land, which means that as you've gotten a little older, there are plenty of things for you to do and places you can spend your time. Her sons treat you well and tell you things about ships, about building, about what they do, and are usually willing to carry you around when it's too dangerous for you to be on your own two feet. And Jay is always waiting at home for you, ready to scoop you up and tell you stories of her past, of Quinn's past, of ancient legends and heroes and monsters. She tells you about Krakens one night and you get a sense of foreboding. It's not much. You hear people talking about the seas and continents in every direction and rumbles, always rumbles, that something big feels like it's waiting to happen. They don't tell you what and Jay tells you you're a little too young to understand it anyway. You see Quinn randomly. For a little while he comes by every two weeks, always talking to Jay in the words you can't understand. You know what they're speaking now though, because Jay rumbles in it with her sons and one day they tell you it is giant. And making sure you're doing okay. He tells you before disappearing into the night that it'll be a little while before he can see you again. And you do not see him for a month and a half. It makes you sad, but you try not to worry too much. You keep your spyglass safe in your room, go with Jay wherever she'll take you, and you know that Quinn will always come back. Your name is Cassandra Veer, and you are going to be a sailor one day. Or a pirate. They're basically the same skill set, with a little disregard for the law in the second one. You know, Jay is a pirate. They seem a lot cooler. You think about opening a bakery instead a few times, but you barely know how to cook. The high seas and adventure are what you've been training for. Your name is Cassandra Veer, and you have been offered a job. It's been a few months, maybe four or five, since you saw Quinn last, but Jay always tells you when he's finally coming back for a visit so you know when to sit and watch the docks. You're more familiar with ships now, you know their ins and outs and where to look for their names and what ships come and go from no man's land most often, and which are lockjaw ships. Jay has long since drilled into your head that you don't want to get on those ships. Make deals with him, sure, because the less you see lockjaw on the seas the safer you'll be, but she has never been one to mince her words about what he'll do to a crewmate he finds useless. So it's not hard to spot the one that Quinn rides in on. You wait on the dock, shifting back and forth. Jay got you new clothes recently, stuff that makes you look more like a sailor than you ever have before, and you're still not used to your new boots or the dual scimitars and dual flintlocks hanging off from your belts. You spot Quinn before he sees you, waiting at the railing for the ship to dock so he can depart. You don't call out to him, not this time, because there's a look on his face you haven't seen in some time and you don't know if you want the news he has to deliver so soon. He finds you easily enough, and he changes his expression just enough that you can't see the worry in his smile unless he gives you a tight hug and a strong pat on the shoulder. He makes the same joke he does every time, that one day you'll be as big as Jay, but it feels sadder this time. You grip the spyglass in your hands as the two of you walk home, and Quinn says nothing. It's only once the door closes that Quinn... He doesn't relax so much as he collapses onto the couch and takes a deep, deep breath. You sit beside him. He doesn't look at you as he takes something out of his pocket, something emblazoned with a mark you've never seen before. And then he tells you about the Umber Arbiters. They're a secret, but one he trusts you with. Something tells you, by the way Quinn explains that they'd always have a place for you, that he knows they're planning to go to sea and doesn't want you to. And they'll always be willing to help if you need it, if you know where to look. 
He tells you about Heaven's Cradle and the cozy shop where their base is, about the couple who runs the organization, about his journeys with them. It's always an open position. You try not to think about why that is. You pretend Jay did not tell you less than two weeks ago the mortality rates among the pirates of No Man's Land. Quinn tells you in a quieter voice about how he's helped so many people, how he's ended up in places where people need help more than he's ever found what he was looking for. It's a miracle he gets paid at all, he jokes, considering his track record of staying behind to help people. You both ignore the way his voice shakes a little. Quinn tells you, quietest of all, that he would always welcome you in. You give him a tight hug. You will not be joining, which he knows. You won't be starting that bakery, which he doesn't. You go out to sea with him when he leaves, and do not get off the boat when he does. Your name is Cassandra Veer, but people have started calling you Ram Horns. It feels obvious as a nickname, considering how your horns grew in, but obvious is easy to guess and easy to shake off. Easy means Gil can shout over the throes of the ocean, and you'll know he, who he's talking to, and easy means people when people approach you on the street with hands on knives they think you can't see, you can scoff at them. Do they think you are stupid enough to identify yourself by your most prominent feature? You can't be the ram horns they're thinking of. You give them other names, names you will not remember once they roll off your tongue, and names they will not believe. It's the way things work now. Gil tells you every time you dock somewhere new that you can't be Cassandra Veer in this line of work. Not if you want a life outside of it, not if you want to survive it. You don't know the real names of most of the people you work with, and some of them you think have long since shed those names anyways. Nicknames have a funny way of making themselves real. You wonder, not for the first time, if Jay ever stood for something. You think of home less now than you did your first few months on the sea, but it always finds its way back to you, even when your spyglass is tucked away. Gil claps you on the shoulder as you watch the latest pickpocket, who tried for your gold pouch, slink away into the shadow. Gil calls you Ramhorns, and you answer his question without thinking too hard about it. Your name is Cassandra Veer. Your name is Ramhorns. You don't know who you want to be anymore. Your name is Cassandra Veer. Your name is Ramhorns. You are under attack. It's not just you, of course, the entire ship you're on is under siege. The privateer in the crow's nest spotted the black sails barely soon enough to call them through the storm. None of you have enough time to do anything but brace yourselves before the first cannonball tears across the deck. The words you were going to say die in your throat as Fear Striker grips the mast and shouts you to move, damn it, ram horns. You don't want to run. If you run, this conversation doesn't happen. If this conversation doesn't happen, you won't be able to tell her another cannonball. This one rocks the ship hard enough that you almost lose your footing. Fear Striker looks at you, begging you to leave. You don't get the chance to tell her that you'll stay and help as someone grabs you and starts to pull you below deck. You know what she's going to do. You don't want her to do it. One of the masks, masks takes a cannonball, creaking so loud it sounds like it's screaming and you know it won't take another. You struggle against the captain's grip, and they pretend not to hear you over the ocean waves and slamming doors. Her scream echoes through the wood, across the waves, off the clouds in the sky. The shadows around the room get longer, stronger, sharper. She doesn't stop screaming as the smell of the ocean turns acrid. Your fingers go numb, your breathing rips out of your throat like a wild animal. You hear wood bending and warping, and dark, thick sea water leaks through the cracks that should be flooding the entire cabin, crawling across the floor. You know what she's doing. People in your profession don't earn their nicknames for no reason. Fear Striker told you once, when you first met, that she's had a lot of nicknames in her life. You do not know any of the others. You do know that there is a tentacle tattooed on her tongue. You were going to ask her about it on the date you were hoping to take her on. You get the sinking feeling that you won't get a chance. The seawater pulls at your legs, and you remember how Jay told you to never swim to a drowning man. Your name is Ramhorns. It hasn't always been, but it is now. You don't know if you'll ever be Cassandra Veer again. Maybe that's for the best. Your name is Ramhorns, and you try not to think about who you used to be. Even Jay calls you Ramhorns now when you get to visit home. 
She's had lots of practice adjusting to new names, and especially for her daughter, she assures you it's no sweat at all. She so rarely calls you her daughter that you don't even fully register the rest of your conversation. Ramhorns is a proud seafaring warrior. Ramhorns is great at firing shots and even better at take doing them. Ramhorns can do anything she's needed for on a ship, can be trusted with command positions and crews of her own. Ramhorns can belt shanties over screaming waves and cut a man's throat while she does it. Ramhorns is a pirate, raised in no man's land with the skills to prove it, all her limbs still attached and both eyes blazing when things get rough. Cassandra Veer is on a beach in the tavern, hiding between crates to watch the ships go by. Safe here, away from the open ocean and the way salty winds sting cuts you didn't know you had. Cassandra Veer wants to open a bakery one day, in the future she'll probably never see. Cassandra Veer is sitting on a couch in a quiet house, wondering if Kryn really was right to invite her along to save the world. Cassandra Veer believes in saving the world. Ramhorns knows that's impossible. Your name is Ramhorns, and you are a damned good pirate. Even better now, because when you pound on your drum, magic happens. You learned a lot, most of what you know, from Jay and the Sea. You've been a pirate for years now. You've lived long enough to get this far with all your limbs and eyes attached, uh, intact. You've turned tides and headlines and snuck things out of po people's pockets for later. And a week ago, you were absentmindedly pounding on a shanty beat, and you realize that if you focus enough, you can do magic. It's something you've heard of, bards whose songs turn back dragons and cut paths through storms and charm all who hear them playing. You've seen them, usually with lutes and ringing brass, calling on sound like a weapon. Gil said he'd had a bard on his ship long before you came along when he gifted you the drum a few weeks ago, but not who they were or where they went. He never suggested you be one, because sometimes having magic on your ship isn't worth the trouble. But it, it seems to have chosen you. You suppose it can't hurt to have another tool in your repertoire. And if magic doesn't work, open it between the eyes probably will. You experiment with what you can do over the next few weeks, talking with Gil and the other crew members to see what they remember from bards they've known. A lot of it seems outside of your grasp for now, but you get the hang of a few spells in the meantime. And if nothing else. The beat of the drum is better for shanties when you can actually hear it over the storm. Your name is Ramhorns, and you are going to Tielen Room. It's not your first visit to the Isles, but it's been a year or two. You enjoy going back to ports like it, ones with towering boats and big spenders, because they change every time you go, with every noble power change and shift in season. A summer birthday means you take your excuses to wander the port around ports when the sun is highest in the sky and revel how the sun changes between land and sea. Not that Tielen Rune ever changes, but that's fascinating in its own ways. Some sailors change, but you lose more faces than you meet new ones. It is your first time bringing Quinn along to Tielen Rune. It's not his first time in Tielen Rune. You've never asked, but you know. You know he's going on air order business, but you've long since stopped asking him about the details. You were never particularly fond of asking him the details. Makes Red River splash behind your eyelids. He's going there and then back as quickly as possible, like all of his arbiter business is. He's looking for something powerful enough that his fingers jump more and more the closer you get to the fog. You don't know if you've ever seen him this nervous. You don't like anything that makes Quinn nervous, but you clap him on the shoulder before he sets off and tell him it'll be fine. He laughs. Your stomach twists as you watch him go. You turn and help unload cargo. Your name is Ramhorns, and you have just found out the man who saved you is dead. It's a thought that's soap in your hands. You can't get a solid grasp on it, but you feel the film it leaves on you, washing away what thoughts you had otherwise. You don't get seasick haven't for years, but the way Lisa's face drains of color leaves you rattled like you are. She keeps apologizing, her low, her voice low and apologetic and thick with the royal Tielen Rune accent. You don't really need to know the answers. Quinn was not as secretive with you and Jay as he confessed he was supposed to be. You know, some of 
who he was expecting and how he was always prone to the quieter, more direct forms of heroism, of course he'd help someone clearly lost in the woods on his way to find the artifact. But asking him the questions feels like you're stalling, having to make sense of what she's telling you. Your eyes are burning and you can't blame the wind. Not here, not the rune. You just want a drink. Luckily, on a ship full of pirates, that's not in short supply. You can't leave Lise here alone. You take her with you. The two of you sit below deck for a while. You almost forget why you're here when you watch Lise choke on vodka she's clearly never had before and burst into big belly laughs that make her cough. She tells you about the little blue fox that seems glued to her side, and she talks about him with an adoration her voice you find is rare in your whole line of work, untouched by any horrors of the outside world. He seems to like you too, which you appreciate. She buried him. You try to think about that after she says it, and you say something about it to her, but the thoughts slip down your throat with the dwarven vodka. You never expected to bury Quinn. You two are leagues apart in life expectancy. But that doesn't make it any less painful to know he was in the wrong place, at the wrong time, with the right person. She tells you she, she could take you to see the grave one day. You almost believe her. Your name is Ramhorns, and you have just said the name Cassandra Vere out loud for the first time in a long while. It feels right, doing this here, doing this now. You don't fully understand all of the concept Lise explained to you, and you doubt you ever will, but something tells you the two of you are going to be in this for the long haul. And if she's willing to tell you about the brand on the back of her neck, you're willing to trust her with your name. And really, it's perfect. You helped give her a name to protect herself, you could give her the name that could hurt you. You have not been Cassandra Vere for years, not really, but she's buried in you somewhere, in the backyard of Jay's house in Quinn's grave. She deserves some recognition here. You say real name. It doesn't feel right, but you don't think Lise would understand. Her past has not been pretty, no one flees to Yellowrun for no reason, and you suspect there's more to her story than she, if she's even told you. But not in the same way as yours. Not in a way you could communicate. Lise introduces herself back. Something in you gets caught in the way she says her own name with confidence and pride. Lise de Forest is a name that feels picked, feels warmed, feels owned. You tell the two, tell her the two of you should stick to fake names. Calling Ramhorns a fake name feels more right than it should. There's things to be done. You try not to think too hard about it. Your name is Ramhorns. Your name was Cassandra Veer. Your name is Cassandra Veer. Your name is Ramhorns. You think you can be both. Your name is Cassandra Veer, and your girlfriend is terrifying. Not in the same way the tree monster is terrifying. The tree monster is terrifying because it seems out for your blood specifically, and because it radiates fear. The tree monster is terrifying because it keeps summoning little vine creatures that tear at your skin and keeps going after you no matter how far Lise tells you to run. Terrifying because it's killing you as fast as you can heal yourself. Terrifying because no one in town could possibly get here to help. Lise is terrifying because she is encased in flames, unleashing magic you thought unattainable by normal people. The one has Lise ever been normal? And rage that it's not just regular rage. It's rage about you. Rage that this thing has hurt you. That it won't refocus on her no matter how much fire she throws at it. The kind of rage that you felt before in raids when opposing forces were going after your crewmates, but deeper. Felt with a force that only she seems capable of. As hot as the fire roaring out of her hands. Your face gets warm and you aren't sure whether that's from the fire or from the thrill that runs down your spine. You think Lise could burn this forest down if she wanted to. You're afraid she will. That time it's definitely a thrill down your spine and you try not to think about the implications while you're busy running for your life. Your name is Cassandra Veer and you are going on a date for the first time in a long, long while. You don't really remember when or what your last date was. Someone somewhere that didn't work out. Maybe you met them while you were docked for a few days and tried this dating thing again. No one that could compare to this. 
Lise lights up as the two of you walk the festival, your hand tight in hers. You get to see her experience the fall for the first time, and you can't help but think about what it'll be like next year. If you'll be here in Caliban, if you'll be in one of the neighboring countries, if you'll be on the road together. Common Sense wants to chime in about the war, and you shake it off in favor at laughing at Fox but chasing a leaf. Her wonder at the little things fills you with the delight you'd long assumed yourself incapable of. The way she gasps and jumps at the traditions you've been following your entire life. Lise holds herself with such confidence that you keep forgetting that she's not from here. But the little cracks in her facade that manage to shine through make you fall in love all over again, every time. Your name is Cassandra Veer, and you are seeing the man haunting your girlfriend for the first time. The guy not in giant castle form, anyway. Bedlam is just how Lise described him, and when he smiles at you, asking to take your girlfriend away from you so they can dance, your skin crawls. You know she's talked about how he can't manipulate the mortal plane. You know that for all this bullshit you've gone through tonight, he's never shown any actual malicious intent. You know that not only can Lise handle herself, but that you'd put six bullets in his head before you let him hurt her. It doesn't make you feel any better when she hands you Fox Bud and tells you that it'll be fine. Or your heart's slow when she's swept away from you and off into the crowd of ghosts, leaving you and Fox Bud alone on a dance floor that shouldn't exist. You try to stick close to them. Dancing with Fox Bud, you try to commit vo Bedlam's voice to memory so you can better picture when Lise tells you about their conversations. Your name is Cassandra Veer, and you are famous. Like, really famous. Famous in more than one place famous. Fan mail famous. Approached by strangers famous. It's kind of unsettling. And it's not the creepy letters. You can throw those away, and any that are particularly heinous least will burn for you in the middle of the post office. No, it's the way people watch you. They're not watching you with the kind of suspicion you're supposed to give in return because you're all on the same level and willing everyone else to mind their own business so that everyone gets home with only sweat to prove it. They're not even really watching you because you're a tiefling and you stand out in a crowd that you suspect a few of them might be doing that as well. No, they're watching you because they think you're a hero. Your name is Cassandra Veer and you feel a little in over your head. You've never been religious. You didn't have the time. But even you know blasphemy when you see it. And it wants to kill you. Your name is Cassandra Veer, and you wish you could stop waking up like this. Not that you mind getting to stare at Lisa's face. But staring up at Lisa's face because she woke up before you and was waiting for you to get up is different than looking up at her because you just went down again and she finished pouring a health potion down your throat, begging you silently that this time you'll get up, just like last time, just like every time after this. Your name is Cassandra Veer, and as you so often find yourself, you are equally confused by and head over heels for Lise. Corpses litter Lockjaw's ship. Lockjaw is dead. The siren song is gone. And your girlfriend just made friends with a kraken. Your name is Cassandra Veer, and you are in love. You think you have been for a little while now, but it hits you when you see Lisa's face framed in fire and starlight, just the two of you, as she leans against you and you put your arm around her without thinking that you would follow this woman to Helen back if she asked. You remember back in No Man's Then knowing you loved her. You remember the weird, confusing thrill when she kissed you, your mind short-circuiting from the feeling of her lips on yours only to crash into the reality that she was drunk and did she mean that? You remember how much you rolled the moment over and over in your mind's eye, trying to decide whether it was worth to, it to ask her if she really liked you or if it was just in the infatuation of a noble stepping into the world for the first time. You remember how your chest had relaxed when she asked you if you asked if you wanted to be her girlfriend. But that was different from here and now. You loved her back in No Man's Land, but that was new and sparkling. Something you could have never seen coming. This This is something you think the two of you could do forever. Something you hope the two of you do forever. You tell her about the bakery. She tells you she'd calm her very nature to make it happen for you. 
If anyone could promise you they'd travel the world and end up back in your arms, it's least a forest. You think idly, as she takes a sip of the wine you looked high and low for her, that you wouldn't mind taking her last name. You nuzzle her temple with your nose and she laughs, cheeks flushed. When she looks at you, you see nothing but adoration. You fought an over-deity for least a forest. You remember that she was ready to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with a pit fiend for you. You lean in to give her a kiss and pretend you're not tempted to linger. Lise asks you to pick her up and carry her to your bed, and you agree without a second thought. For a night, the two of you two are lost in bliss. Your name is Cassandra Veer, and you are watching your girlfriend plummet to her death. Your heartbeat is the loudest it's ever been in your ears, maybe the loudest thing you have ever heard. You've almost died before, sure, and you've seen Lise go down before, but this is different. You can revive someone with a healing potion as long as there's still life left in their body. There will be no body to hold life if she hits that stomach acid. You cling to the rocks, and even as you scream at her to not do this, you see a familiar light flourish around her as she falls. Her I love you rattles in your chest like a loose screw. You feel like you've stopped breathing. You shout out to her again, managing to slam a beat on your drum again for any hope that the two of you will walk out of there. She looks like she's laughing. You almost consider following her down. She catches the feather. She hits the acid. She disintegrates. You feel your entire world starts to crumble. And then she explodes. You know the Legends of the Phoenix. You've met a phoenix. The specific phoenix that powers Lise, even. None of that prepares you for the burst of heat and sound that shakes the cavern. You've been close, too close, to Lise when she's powered up by the feather. You know what she's capable of, what she's done, what she's threatened to do. You remember, dimly, her talking about not being able to die. Words that you always thought were jokes, that you followed with cautions not to test that theory, and brief, smiling kisses. You've never seen anything like this. You see Lise reborn in flame and light. Your heart trips over itself when you just know she's taking a rattling breath, even from this far away. The cavern is rumbling, reeling from her flames, and if you weren't numb with shock, you think you'd be crying. Things pass in a blur for a while. You watch Professor Graves rescue Lise, rescue the principal. You see Lise firing off smells with her hair floating, framing her face in a divine glow. You fire your pistols wherever you could find a target. The cavern stops moving. The two of you make it to the entrance. The struggle overcomes Lise as she collapses in the entryway. You pull together the last of your strength and you don't even bother with your drum. You breathe the life back into her with a gross, slimy kiss. And the second the world slows back down as she looks up at you, conscious again, you wrap your arms around each other and sob. Your name is Cassandra Veer and there is a statue of you in the middle of one of the largest cities in the world. It's not just you. Honestly, Lise is more focused than you are, but it's still you. You, rendered in stone forever. You, posed as a hero. You were a pirate four months ago. Your name is Cassandra Veer, and for the first time in three months, you're having doubts. Well, not the first time. Not really. But these ones feel so much sharper. Because you know this is the man who killed Quinn. You know this is something deeply important to Lise. But there are flaws in his plan, ones you can and can't see. But you can't shake the sensation that maybe he's not wrong. It's not a fun thing to think. You wish you hadn't said it, because there's a jagged heartbreak in Lise's eyes when you do, and the t tugs on old scars you didn't know you had. She accuses you in words you don't even fully register because for the first time you feel the lick of Lisa's anger. The anger that's gotten you this far, that's protected you despite itself. Lise doesn't want to hurt you. The fire doesn't want to hurt you, but their nature is not a careful one. Even embers burn. You don't know if you lose all of your doubts, but you hear Lise out, watch her recover, and reassure her that you're still going to stand by her side. The fight is messy. It's hot. It's weird. Something is off about all of this, and Varric taps his staff on the ground. Your name is Cassandra Veer, 
and it has been five years.